Good morning, everybody, and welcome to my live stream all about business today. Good morning, Ray. I see you're waiting there. Um, so if you have any questions about starting or running a business or any aspect of business, you can fire away and stick them in the live stream box there now, and we'll deal with them as best we can. Best we can. I hope you can hear um, you can hear the uh, the audio okay and, and the um, the vision is okay. I think it is, and if a microphone, uh, which is um, an improvement on last week. Last week the sound was a bit a bit dodgy. So if as I say, I've started and run various businesses since 1986 in Ireland in various industries, and ranging from retailing to construction to property investment to online marketing to all sorts of things so um audio is good sounds great that's good i have a new microphone there plugged into my google chromebook so uh it's better than last week now as i say if you have any questions in relation to starting or running a business or online marketing or digital marketing or anything of that nature property um bianca has has joined me on instagram lives there so if it, the whole question of starting or running a business is of interest to you or concerns you then fire away and and stick the questions in the box there Obviously, I can only answer questions that are put to me, and um, I have a background in small business and so on, and running a business is something that is suitable for some people and isn't suitable for other people, and obviously, um, hello Frank, and hello Skilt, and Celtic Touch HS, and Paul Carey, good morning to all of you. And thanks for joining the live stream. Um, Andrew Getwin, greetings from Navin. Hello, Andrew, how are you? I hope um, if you're thinking about running a business or starting a business that you might have a question or two for me. If you do, well, I'm good. Michael O'Donnell, good morning. Michael, how are you? Did you ever give your business a personal loan and charge interest on it? Did I ever give my business a personal loan and charge interest on it? I did actually, and that's quite a good question. And inevitably, if you are involved in business and you are hustling and grinding and trying to build a business down through the years, as a sole operator, as a sole trader, as an entrepreneur, you invariably end up an awful lot of the time subsidizing your business with either money or labor and i have given money to my businesses from time to time to get them going and to run them and to overcome the peaks and troughs that you are inevitably going to run into in running a business i have uh, given the loan and the question of director's loans and promoter's loans and drawings and so on and so forth is something that needs careful assessment and careful advice as well from an accountant or you know whoever's running your accounts needs to be very very careful in how the likes of company or directors loans and loans to businesses uh, are dealt with shane b mail would you advise setting up a company to hold buy to let properties I can't see any huge advantage, to be honest with you, Shane. I left, I dealt with this, or I had this question last week on the, um, the other Ask Me Anything live stream. There is no huge advantage to it, and inevitably, when you go to set up a limited company in any uh, for, for any activity, for any purpose, the bank is going to be looking for a personal guarantee in respect of the loans anyway. Now, from a day-to-day -day trading operation uh, perspective, you might be as well off having a limited company, but I can't see any huge benefit at the outset. And having the property, the assets in your own, your own name may well be uh, as, as good as anything. 
And as I say, even if you have them in a company name, you're setting up a certain or a certain extra level of uh, administration to be dealt with, returns to be done, and inevitably the bank is going to be looking for guarantees, personal guarantees, in respect of the company's loans, you know. Do, 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 do. Paul Carey says, I'm about to launch a website design business for health and well-being specialists. Is it unethical to contact them during these crazy times? Paul, I don't think it's unethical. There's no difficulty setting up the business that you're proposing to set up. But what I would be worried about for in that particular area, obviously it's something that you know something about and are familiar with and have experience in, but website design is a very, very competitive business very competitive and it's difficult to differentiate yourself from other website designers quite frankly and nowadays there's so many options between wordpress and the uh, squarespace and all sorts of operations that um it's easy enough for people to set up themselves now that's not to say that you won't do well and you won't provide a good business or you won't provide a good service for your punters for your clients but the bottom line is it's nearly a commodity a website now as opposed to something that's highly skilled and that's going to generate a huge amount of a huge amount of profit what pitfalls to avoid when beginning a company there's no difficulty beginning a company and in terms of avoiding pitfalls i mean you can do a google search for a company registration and company formation quick company formation and so on if you do a google search there now you're going to find any number of outfits in Ireland that will set you up in a limited company within a matter of days and within a matter of weeks uh, or within a matter of days rather for relatively small money 250 to 350 quid plus fat perhaps okay that's the setting up the company part and that's easy enough to do however making money is a different ballgame altogether and you need to separate or divorce the idea that you have or the business that you have from the structure that you set up so the structure is one thing anybody can set up a structure anybody can set up a limited company but the business getting punters getting clients having a worthwhile business that's going to generate sufficient revenue to exceed your expenses and so on that's a different situation and it really doesn't make any difference as to the particular structure you use because you can sort out the structure later on the key at the outset is to get punters to have a viable business a viable plan viable turnover and in the land of the blind the one-eyed man is king in the land of business startups cash is king so you want positive cash flow Mamo 4K, hello, uh, Mamo 4K, Shin, that's great, thanks, sorry. Um, AC16, is it wise to start a business while in university when you see an opportunity, or are you better off holding off until you're older, 20 years old, thanks. Just to make any difference, really, um, it's not a, not a bad idea to um, start off early. I, I started my business, my first business when I was 23, which was very young. I was only graduated two years or three years at the time I graduated when I was 20 from UCD with a BCom, a Bachelor of Commerce degree. I was going to emigrate to the United Kingdom. It was 1986. It was an absolutely appalling time from an economic perspective in Ireland. The economy was tanked. There was multiple general elections coming one after the other. We kept changing governments. Charlie Hawhey was in his pomp, if you could call it that. And uh, I was heading for England. And um, one thing led to another. I got a job that kept me here and i stayed on then for a year or two and then i started my own business with my brother in glass nevin in 1986 which worked out well so the age is not the barrier it's your mental maturity and your application and your willingness to work work hard so that's what i would say to you ac16 nikki ade hi terry hello nikki Paul Ray Pierce, hello Ray. Is there a standard contract available to protect you if you invest in a company? No, there isn't a standard contract and obviously any investment in any company is going to give rise to certain terms and conditions and that will depend on you know how you're investing, what sort of uh, circumstances or what sort of terms and conditions you're investing under, who's doing the investing for you, what way you're doing it. I mean, for example, you can invest in a company by going to 
buy shares in B at Bank of Ireland or AIB or Smurfits or Ryanair or wherever, you can do that easily. I mean, you know, that's investing in a company and clearly you are dealing with a publicly quoted company. You're going to expect certain standards to be applied in relation to the administration and ongoing uh, running of the company and the maintenance of the shares and so on and so forth. Uh, and you're going to have certain succor or comfort from knowing that there is the Companies Act which is going to apply. There's going to be stock market regulations and so on and so forth in relation to having shares in, as I say, Smurfits or Ryanair or whatever. And you can easily buy shares and invest in company. I have a website or I have a video rather on this YouTube channel about the gyro trading, uh, D-E-G-I-R-O. I use the gyro myself for buying shares and I buy shares basically and I hold them. I hold on to them. I don't speculate or don't turn them over quickly. I'm not a day trader. I'm in it for the long haul because in the long haul, uh, investing in shares is quite a good it's quite a good investment. However, in the last three, four months, they've absolutely tanked, uh, unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 situation. Now, that's something that's completely unprecedented and it's beyond anybody's control, but I do expect the shares to come back in due course and over a period of time, 5, 10, 15 years, shares do perform quite well. <laughs> what about getting other shareholders involved? Do NDAs really hold up? An NDA is going to be very difficult to apply, quite frankly, and that's the reality of it. And the High Court made reference to this recently in a case involving a restrictive covenant involving Peter Bellew and Ryanair and... Um, Hi, Laura Merriman. Um, the Ryanair and Peter Bellew case is one which uh, the High Court made a comment there that in relation to restrictive covenants and trade confidentiality and trade secrets and all, uh, that type of thing, it's actually very, very difficult to apply uh, and to continue to apply. So NDAs are of only limited value, quite frankly. Getting other shareholders involved is fine, but I mean, the bottom line is, if you're going to invest your money in a company or in any sort of an investment, you do need to be careful that you are able to get your money back and uh, get your, your investment back. Carol Luke, good afternoon, Carol. Just in relation to um, setting up a business at any age, that chap there, ACT, or AC16, obviously, you know, you can set up at any age and the how you're going to do is going to depend in on your level of maturity the amount of capital you've available to you how willing you are to work how committed you are and so on and so forth the great thing about starting early and as i say i started early but the great thing about starting early is that if you fail you can actually recover um i've seen a lot of people making the mistake of waiting all their life to start a business and then if they fall flat on their face or if it doesn't go so well, they actually end up uh, being unable to recover. Whereas when you're young and you're brave and you're foolish and you're naive, sometimes it's you're as well off to have that element of naivety or stupidity, quite frankly, sometimes, because you will recover if you, if you can. I had a friend, we started business very, very early. I was 23, he was only 20, and he actually went bankrupt or his business went bust relatively uh, at a very early age in his career but he actually recovered and recovered really really well and is now doing really well for himself again so again he's an example of somebody who um who recovered from an early setback and quite frankly if you're young and you've nothing to lose the bank may well treat your um uh, business going under as something that they're going to just say, well, there's not much point in pursuing him because you can't get blood from a stone. He's a young lad and he's no assets and that's it. Whereas if you're older and you've waited for years, you've built up assets, you might have a house on the line, etc. It's a different ball game. You might find that the lender, the banks are going to go after you, you know. Adam Graham, good afternoon, Adam. Setting up a limited company, any recommendation on keeping basic accounts during the startup phase? Not really, Adam. Um, no, there's various packages out there, but um, half decent accountant or bookkeeper, but an accountant that's sort of attuned to the needs of small business owners and isn't going to rip you off and isn't too 
uh, too posh to wash as it were if they're prepared to get down and dirty with you and cut you a bit of slack when you're starting off um that's the type of individual that i'd be going with and um a very very basic spreadsheet for example google sheets or even microsoft spreadsheets whatever you call it excel is as good as anything to keep your accounts in the early stages but i would strongly recommend that you get good advice legal and accounting advice starting off because you can make some bad decisions and um, leave yourself exposed to the revenue commissioners coming calling if you let your liabilities for VAT and so on and so forth, PAYE, PRSA, etc. build up, you know. Do you have to set up a company if you're a hobby, part-time company, gross earning sub 35K? No, you don't have to set up a company. You don't have to set up a company at all. The reason you might set up a company is because you want to incorporate a particular structure or run your business with a particular structure. And um, that's why you'd set up a level of company. But I mean, there's no there's no uh, restriction on you turning over 35 grand or 35 million. You could tur turn over three and a half million or 35 million as a sole trader. There's no difficulty there. But the reason you might set up a limited company would be to give yourself the protection of limited liability and so a limited company is a separate legal entity and has a corporate or a legal personality rather so that if the business goes bust then strictly speaking the creditors of the business of the company are going to have a hard time because all the company is liable for is its uh, paid up share capital Whereas if it's a sole trader situation that goes bust, or indeed a partnership that goes bust, well, then you're looking at uh, the creditors coming after you personally and perhaps getting a judgment against you and perhaps uh, registering that judgment against your house or any other assets that you might have. And um, so that's why you'd set up a limited company. But the limited company set up and the limited company protection is if you pardon the pun, of limited value to a certain extent because the banks are going to look for personal guarantees from directors when they come to lend them money. So you, you will have protection from ordinary trade creditors and you'll have uh, protection from certain uh, preferential creditors if the company goes into liquidation, for example. But the likelihood is that the bank is going to have got a limited or have got a guarantee from you in respect of any borrowings etc etc you're a bit slow with the questions there today now you're a bit slow with the questions but i mean a lot of people make the mistake and i'm always asked this question like what's the best structure etc and should i set up, set up a limited company or should, should i set up a partnership and so on but people, I think, get the cart before the horse insofar as I don't think they should be all that concerned about the structure so much as having a viable idea, having a viable business and having an ability to generate clients, having an ability to generate sufficient sufficient turnover to actually make a profit. And as I say, cash is king, especially in the early stages of a business, because the most likely time that you're going to go belly up with a business is in the early stages and statistics have shown that most businesses will go um go all up in the first i think it's 33 percent uh or the first the early stages of of their incorporation or setup if they can withstand for example the first year or first three years the far far better chance most of them go bang in in the very early stages so that's why you would need to have uh, a positive cash flow or a business that's going to throw off cash to allow you to sustain the early stages which can be very very difficult any basic accounting advice for first-time business owners as i say the best thing to do is to get a half decent accountant who's going to treat you okay and is going to cut you a bit of slack and uh, allow you to find your feet and not be too hard on you in terms of uh, fees and not too hard on you in terms of the payments is it advisable to charge VAT from the get-go not necessarily it'll depend on the business that you're in and it'll depend on the industry you're in 
um, and obviously it depends on the your level of turnover and so on and so forth. It'll also depend on whether you're selling goods and services, and it'll also depend on whether you are, for example, uh, providing a service that has a 0% rate or 23% or 13.5%. For example, if you were a butcher or if you were in fruit and veg, then everything that you sell is at zero. And therefore, if you register for VAT, you don't have to worry about a VAT liability. However, all of your purchases, for example, bags and perhaps rent on your premises and the little van that you're going to use, the leasing, the VAT on those uh, outgoings, those expenses is going to be reclaimed by you. So you'll actually be in a positive reclaim situation from the word go. However, if you are doing websites and that sort of thing, well, then you're probably going to be charging 23% for a professional service so you need to weigh up carefully and speak to your accountant as to what is the best time when is the best time to uh, register for that skill team major soda bread this morning is a 45 plus meal that has never entered the domain of the kitchen or cook big man oh man the belly is full that's good i'm glad you like the bread and it worked out okay Frank Trapp is saying, what is the legal structure to setting up a business as a sole trader, as a partnership, or to live in a company? Well, as a sole trader, there's not, nothing to stop anybody from working away and, and providing a service or selling goods or services as a sole trader. In other words, they're not a partner and they're not a limited company. Uh, partnership, obviously, then you are in a situation, you're in partnership with somebody else. You could be in partnership with a number of people. Each of the partners are jointly and severally liable for the liabilities of the partnership. That means, just to be clear, that if you're in a partnership with somebody else and they go absolutely bananas, they go to Spain or someplace, uh, they go to um, Las Vegas and, and engage in all sorts of activities that mightn't be recommended, and hold themselves out as a partner of you and are known as a partner of, of, of your business, then joint and several liability means that all of you are on the hook, both partners are on the hook for the uh, misdoings or um, misdeeds of each partner. So that's something you need to be careful about. Limited company then, as I say, it's a sole or it's a um, particular, um, particular structure where uh, the limited company has a separate legal personality and the reason it's called a limited company is because the liability of the company is limited to the pay paid up share capital so if the business goes wallop well then there's a good chance that ordinary creditors are going to be stung and everybody else quite frankly is going to be stung but the promoters or directors of the company the shareholders uh, will have a certain degree of protection. Do, 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 do. Georgios Logotitis is asking, what's the cost of setting up an LLC in Ireland? I would estimate 250 to 350 quid would probably do it. If you do a simple Google search for quick company formation or express company formation or something like that, you're going to you are going to um, get a company set up easily enough for that sort of money. Sean Clonan, what do you think about the High Court challenge by John Waters and Jim O'Doherty against the constitutionality of the emergency legislation and measures taken by the government for COVID-19? I don't know much about it. I don't know much about it, and that's not really a business question. Uh, and today is all about business. So I'll have to pass on that one. D. Keen says, hi, Terry, property question. I'm thinking of buying a block of about three apartments, live in one and lease out the others with a rent a room relief. Rent a room relief. Would that be allowed or would it be classed as a commercial property and not a residential property? If you're thinking of buying a block of three apartments, that would be a commercial property. In fact, yeah, that'll be a commercial property in my view, and you're going to have the commercial property conversation with the lender. So you might rent out a room or whatever in one of the apartments yourself, but ultimately you're probably looking at um, 
that commercial loan and you may also be looking at a management company situation there you need to be careful about that strictly speaking three apartments is not going to give rise to a management company situation because you need at least five for the multi-unit development act to apply however uh, the likelihood is you're not going to buy three apartments on their own they may be in a block you may have a management company but i think that's going to be a commercial property and it's not going to be a residential uh, property as such so i think you're looking at a commercial property and that has its own issues um it has its own issues and obviously probably a shorter a term in terms of the loan and probably more uh, legal expenses for you because generally when you're buying a commercial property one like buying a house or a residential property then you are looking at having to pay the bank's legal fees as well so that's something that you need to factor in paul carey cheers for all the great answers as a sole trader is it advisable to divide any payments into 50 percent for owner's payment 25 percent for expenses 20 percent for tax and five percent for profit Paul, you can divide it up any way you like, but the bottom line is, and I might sound like a broken record here, but you need to generate cash first. You need to generate turnover. You need to generate business, clients, call it what you like, and you can divide it up any way you like after that. And as I say, a lot of people make a mistake when they're starting out in business of worrying about structure and worrying about things that really are not priorities. The priority is to have viable business a viable idea and have an ability to generate clients either for service that you're selling or for the products that you're serving or selling rather d fresher good morning d how are you or good afternoon now any more questions there for me on relation to setting up and starting your running your own business or marketing online or digital marketing video marketing anything of that nature brand building As a matter of interest, and just to go back to that question there of Sean Clonans in relation to uh, Gemma Waters or Gemma O'Doherty and John Waters, my gut, and I don't know much about it, and I haven't looked into exactly what they are proposing to do, but my gut is that they will uh, not be successful. And I think in the interests of the greater good, that obviously, and in the interest of public policy that from time to time the people's rights have to be by definition restricted and that the courts are always and we always as individuals we are all concerned with our own rights but there's always a balancing of rights to be done between your right to do x y or z and somebody else's right to do x y or z and you will find that very very few rights are absolute in other words they are relative and they do impact on other people and the courts are always concerned about balancing the rights of one individual or one group with another individual or another group diana how are you a little about director's loan to the company please what do you want to know diana about director's loan to the company obviously there's no difficulty with a director giving a loan to the company um how it's treated then for uh, accounting purposes and taxation purposes is a slightly different matter um, and how the company is going to repay the loan and so on is is another matter but there's no difficulty with an individual giving a loan to a company or indeed a company giving a loan to an individual however if the company gives the loan to the individual then there's going to be a benefit in kind perhaps if the loan is given at a preferential rate or if there is no if there is no interest being charged michael o'donnell hi terry i've been advised to hire staff through farm relief services ireland because it's fully tax deductible i was thinking of hiring my girlfriend to run a holiday let that we have Michael, I'm not sure about the relationship situation there, and maybe your girlfriend is of long standing, uh, the, the long standing variety, or maybe she's a new one. But uh, I can't advise you on that situation. I'll give you a lot of advice, all right, but not on the girlfriend situation. But in terms of getting um, staff through farm relief service fully tax deductible, yeah, that's fair enough. And to be honest with you, anything that will allow you to. Um, well, 
I'll put it another way. When you take on employees, there is quite an extensive range of employment legislation which protects employees and can make it difficult from time to time for employers. So if you can get farm relief people to do the work for you uh, and that's satisfactory, et cetera, et cetera, well, then um, that's something that you probably should consider. And, you know, managing employees and, and is, is a difficult enough and time-consuming task from time to time. So anything that can reduce that or avoid that is probably going to be beneficial enough to you in your situation. And as I say, your girlfriend, I don't know if she's happy enough to, if she's happy enough to do the work well and good. What will be the implications COVID-19 for startups? The implications of COVID-19 for everybody is an absolute shitstorm, quite frankly. And a lot of businesses are not going to open again. And, um, COVID-19 is having huge, huge implications for all sorts of small businesses. I see Michael O'Donnell is asking me there, have you, can you see any trouble hiring spouses? There's no trouble with hiring spouses apart from the interpersonal difficulties that may arise of working with the same person uh, day in, day out, and then living with them, and then bringing home issues in the workplace and that sort of thing. That can be difficult, and I, I know that myself because my wife no longer works with me. She works with another solicitor, funny enough. If you're self-employed, permanent resident of Canada, but still earn income from rent in Ireland, is there any benefit of forming a company for the Canadian business and Irish property? I cannot give you any advice about Canadian uh, tax situation or uh, being a permanent resident of tax uh, or permanent resident of Canada. There is international taxation agreements between various jurisdictions and quite what the one between Canada and Ireland is, I don't know. That's not a question I would be fit to answer, quite frankly. Adam Graham, I've got a brand, but no product yet. Would you try and build up an audience now or wait until you've got a product to sell? How would you start out now with your benefit of hindsight? Adam Graham, I've got a brand, but no product yet. I'm not sure what you're really asking there, Adam, but I'm not sure what your brand is because obviously if you've no product or no service, what your brand is associated with or what it stands for, um, I don't know. You know, you say you have a brand, but you know, you could certainly try and build build a tribe or build an audience, all right, but you will need some sort of expertise or something to differentiate yourself from other people and to be able to show that, yes, you can be trusted, yes, you're likable, and yes, uh, you have something to offer by way of value for whoever is going to gather around you and build a community. Obviously, the whole idea of building any business is to build a community and to um, do what you can in terms of building a tribe of followers. You don't need a huge tribe. You do need some uh, people who think that you are the shizzle, quite frankly, and who like, know, and trust you. But building a brand is one thing. Having a product or a service to offer is quite another, you know. Paul Carey says, if I'm a sole trader, what should my title be for the likes of business cards or my email signature? You can call yourself what you like, basically. I mean, you can just call yourself the owner, I suppose, or the owner or promoter or moving or shaker or whatever, but the title wouldn't be too concerned about. If you just describe yourself as the owner, Paul, you're probably as well off, you know? What's new with Prince? Hello, I'm interested in property investing and I'd like to get into the buy-to-let market. What qualities and areas of expertise should I consider when it comes to working with a solicitor? You don't need any qualities in order to work with a solicitor apart from the ability to listen. You need to listen to your solicitor, but you need to find a good solicitor. You don't need any particular qualities in terms of buy to let, but I've just finished editing a video there this morning, which will be going up on my YouTube channel in the not too distant future about property investment and about, about this dream that many people have of building a property portfolio. In the video, I recount a Saturday morning, just like this morning, when I went down to uh, one of my investment properties and I discovered that the tenant was gone and there was a dog inside chewing the leg off the table. Uh, 
It transpired that the guards had come about three days prior, had knocked down the door and arrested your man and brought him off to Castlery Prison and he was remanded in custody to Castlery. The consequence of this was about nine months of no rent coming off that particular unit and uh, a new door. So, you know, things can go pear-shaped from time to time. You can have good plans. You can have good schedules. You, you can have good spreadsheets. You can do good analysis in terms of shopping around for the best deal in terms of interest and so on. But buy-to-let investment is not all that straightforward. People have a dream that it is, and it's, you know, they can do the calculations with a spreadsheet. Anybody can work a spreadsheet, quite frankly. But when you go to an apartment and you find that you haven't been paid rent for six months or 12 months. And it's very, very difficult from a legal perspective to get somebody out of the apartment. Then you are looking at a period during which you're going to get no rent. Then your calculations can go out the window. So your spreadsheet will be of limited value then, you know. But in terms of getting into the area, you don't need any particular, really what you need, I think, uh, you need a good solicitor and you need a good surveyor. After that, you need to listen to them because everybody, nobody has expertise in everything so what you do is you buy the expertise you get a solicitor and you get a surveyor who will do a good uh, cost effective analysis report survey structural survey for you on the property chris m is asking is there any gdpr implications in emailing business for the first time in terms of doing business development yes there is it's actually unlawful and you wouldn't think it because i get emails myself from time to time but sending unwanted uh, uncalled for unwarranted emails of a commercial nature to other businesses is against the law and i'm surprised there isn't more complaints because an awful lot of business send out bullshit emails quite frankly spam i get them all the time myself and i'm put on these lists i never signed up and if you are on an email list of mine and i have eight thousand subscribers every single one of those people have double opted in in other words they've opted in in the first instance and then they've confirmed that they want to opt in and i'm very very careful about that and at the end of every single email that i send out there's a link the link is unsubscribe me no problem because you know, there's no point in me sending the shit out to people who don't want to hear from me. I want to send information that's of benefit and of use to people who have an interest in what I have to say. I don't want to be sending out unwanted messages to people. So there is GDPR issues there, and you do need to be careful. Do, 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 do. J1 Adventures. Hi, Terry. Is it possible to buy a product that already exists, rebrand, change, and improve the product and resell? Yes, it is. And that gives rise to the question. That's provided you're not breaking or breaching uh, anybody's trademark or copyright entitlements, intellectual property rights, and so on. But you will find as you progress through life, as I have, and as many observers have, that there's very new, very few new things in life. In other words, a lot of things, a lot of improvements are iterations or slight changes on what has gone before. But there's very few really new novel ideas, etc. So the whole idea of getting somebody else's product or service and adapting it and changing it and tweaking it, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. And that's quite, that's how progress is made actually. And you know? also I don't see any difficulty with that provided you're not breaking anybody's uh, intentional or intellectual property rights. If you were interested in starting a business in an industry that is currently illegal in Ireland, but is likely to be illegal in the future, such as recreational cannabis, how would you approach starting? I'd roll myself a big one. <laughs> I know. Um, I don't know. I mean, obviously, you know, you, you have an idea about a particular industry that, or a particular business that's, you know, recreational cannabis. It may well become legal in the future. That's fair enough. But you obviously have to be in, in for the long haul and you may have deep pockets and you may be prepared to be patient and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, being able to, being in a position to wait that long, that's up to yourself. It's down to your personal circumstances 
taxes, etc. But in the meantime, if you've got a wife and a few kids and you're a mortgage to pay, you're not going to be able to afford to wait. No, maybe you'll be able to do it as a hobby or something. And if that's the case, well and good. Shauna Dunn. Hello, Shauna. Hi, Terry. I got a loan in 07, 10K to set up a business. Unfortunately, failed and loan went to debt agency who said, written off in 2010, but still an ICB report and affects access to credit. Any advice? I don't have any advice apart from to contact the ICB outfit. I think there is a certain period of time uh, where the register or where that particular black mark against you will have spent its course in other words it'll be like spent convictions there's a spent convictions situation there for minor convictions which people don't have to disclose after a certain number of years especially smaller um district court convictions and i think there's a similar situation applying in relation to uh, loans especially small loans that you might have failed um to repay so check with the icb the credit board or whatever they call them the credit bureau uh, and see what's the story there because i think if you do a little bit of digging around there i think you will find there will be some comfort there for you after a certain period of time and remember the statute of limitations for breach of contract is six years so the likes of a judgment or the likes of that sort of thing uh, i think it's six years that you know you're you're home and hosed but obviously it will be causing you some issue in relation to in relation to getting ongoing finance, etc. Michael O'Donnell says, Hi hey, Terry, any good stories about Michael O'Leary and the man's way of thinking in business when he was running news agents? That raises an interesting question. I've told the story before. Back in 1987, 1988, I went out to Walkinstown and I met a fella. I was encouraged to meet him and uh it transpired to make a long story short it was michael o'leary and his business he was running a small news agents at the time i think he had two small news agents at the kestrel i think it was a kestrel roundabout or the walkerstown roundabout and one of the news agents was called the kestrel and not too long afterwards he ended up going back out of the business and went back into accountancy he became personal assistant to tony ryan and tony ryan sent him out to dublin airport and ryan said run out go out to dublin airport there and run around there and o'leary in his wisdom carried out an analysis carried out a survey of the business and told tony ryan to close it up he would put him on the road Ryan says, no, I'm not doing that. It's staying open and I want you to run it. I want you to go to Texas and co uh, copy your man, Southwest uh, Airlines, whatever they're called, uh, Herb something is his name, and uh, Herb Kelleher, I think his name is. Copy that formula, copy that method, uh, copy that strategy that did that. And then Seamus Brennan, who was Minister for Transport at the time, took a landing slot from Stansted, I think, from Aer Lingus and gave it to Ryanair and the rest is history but if tony ryan quite frankly listened to michael o'leary at the time i think you'd never have heard of ryanair because if ryan uh, listened to o'leary and followed his advice ryanair would have been closed up but tony ryan was was obviously a pioneer and a, a genius um certainly he got that right anyway but in terms of all year, yeah, I met him on a Saturday morning out in, in Walkinstown and I actually, um, we had a chat, we had similar backgrounds. He's from Mullingar, I went to school in Mullingar, he went to school in Kildare, I'm from Kildare, and with similar backgrounds. He did a BBS in Trinity, I did a BCom in UCD, and um, we had mutual friends in Mullingar. <coughs> Frank Trapp says that this occurs if you have no active loans within the past five years or your data has not been registered with ICB by the relevant member. Thanks, Frank. Yeah, I think ICB loan question. So I think Frank is saying there that um, if there's no active loans within the last five years, perhaps you, you come off the register or you're no longer uh, have the black mark against you or whatever. I'm not 100% about that, but um, have a look at it. ICB loan question. That's the credit bureau the irish credit bureau whatever you call them but i think there will be some uh, some silver there in that 
the cloud for you. Skilt T, I'm currently selling a branded product that I purchased from a liquidation sale. The brand owner has contacted me to stop selling the product that I purchased. Well, I don't know on what basis the brand owner would be contacting you to stop uh, or to, to prevent you from selling it unless, well, I don't really know and I don't know the details of that. Um, you bought it from liquidation sale. I'm hoping that it was a genuine liquidation sale and not some sort of a knockoff. In other words, you may have got a letter saying that um, you are selling a knockoff of somebody's intellectual property, for example, Nike runners or Lacoste t-shirts or something. Don't know the details there, but um, obviously if you receive a solicitor's letter or if you receive a letter threatening you with legal proceedings arising from your breach of somebody else's trademark or intellectual property then you have to take it seriously so i don't know the details there you probably would want to go and get advice about that j1 adventures hi terry what type of insurance would your company need to sell your own bicycles um well i suppose you just need public liability i mean obviously you'd go to an insurance company or go to an insurance broker and say exactly what you're proposing to do and you'd get cover for the, the relevant areas, employment, um, liability, employer's liability, rather public liability and so on and so forth. And bottom line is, again, like shopping around, getting the best advice, getting the expertise, you shop around and you go to a broker or an insurance company, tell them what you're proposing to do and, um, get the appropriate policy. <coughs> Adam Graham says, any tips on getting a new product to the consumer market online? There's no problem getting the product to the consumer market online, but it's going to be very, very competitive and you're going to need to build small or start small and, and build up. You need to build some sort of brand awareness either of you or of your or of your product and you know depending on the product you may involve you may get involved in some sort of free promotions you may look at sort of um, some sort of advertising online i know for example that i'm advertised very heavily on youtube and i advertise heavily on facebook and i know that the advertising i do on those two markets are very very effective and, and very very cost effective but in terms generally of launching a consumer product i mean obviously it's not going to be easy but i would always uh, encourage people and advise people to fish where the fish are in other words you need to find out who will be the ultimate consumer or user of that product and you need to meet them there then wherever they are so they may be on twitter they may be on facebook they may be on linkedin they may be on youtube you can look at a bit of social media marketing you can look at video marketing you can look at advertising online and there is very very good value to be had in advertising online at the moment in ireland because it's not saturated like it is in the uk or united states pure unintentional ASMR, what should a landlord do if they have long-term renters claiming squatters' rights and refusing to pay rent or leave house? What would the legal costs be of removing them? The landlord needs to, I mean, I presume you're a residential landlord and not a commercial. If it's commercial, you need to go to the circle court, quite frankly, and you need to get an order uh, on foot of the lease that you have, uh, of which you're the landlord, and basically you're looking for an order from the circle court uh, for vacant possession based on the breach of the covenant or condition in the lease to pay rent. If it's a residential situation, obviously you have to go to the residential tenancies board and uh, that can be a slow process, but that's the way you have to go, unfortunately. If they're claiming squatters' rights and so on and so forth, that's a different ballgame altogether. They have to make an application to the um, property registration authority, and that's a slow process. In the meantime, it can be difficult for you, obviously, but uh, it's, a, it's either the circuit court or the residential tenancies board, depending on whether it's a commercial or residential property.
skilled tea says they went that way but I receipts and packaging sample was sent to them they agreed that the product was genuine brand owners told me to stop selling the product I don't know why they're selling telling you to stop selling the product I mean if somebody was selling my products for me I'd be happy enough but perhaps you're not selling them in a market that will sort of uh, will might affect their branding or their image or whatever I don't know the basis or the background of that there's details there that I'm not getting um and this isn't really the place to do it, you know, but um, it depends on, on, on what basis they're asking you to stop selling the stuff. My partner's 33, he's no mortgage on a house and a successful business, is thinking of le leasing equity in a house to buy land and build two houses to sell any advice and set up company for this, etc. Um, he needs to know what he's doing in terms of building and in the current market, it could be slow enough selling houses because the COVID-19 situation has slowed everything down. But I mean, there's no difficulty. I don't know why or what this obsession people have with setting up a company for, like you can buy, set up a company tomorrow or the next day if you want to, you know, spend 250 quid, 350 quid and you have a company set up, but that's not the point. The point is, are you gonna be able to build the houses at a rate at a cost that's going to give you a good return? Um, are you going to get planning information? Are you going to get bogged down in objections? Are you going to get bogged down in toing and froing to the planning authority and putting in uh, amended plans and providing further information and so on and so forth? These are the issues you need to be thinking about, not whether you should set up a limited company to build two houses or not. Um, you need to get the building correct first, you need to get the site cost right first, you need to get the construction cost right, you need to get the design right, and you need to ensure that there is ultimately a punter at the end of the day, and always you need to be looking at the end game, and the end game is always having a punter to buy something off you, whether it's a product or a service. Setting up a limb in a company is is uh, neither here nor there, quite frankly. It doesn't make any difference. It's like moving the chairs around on, a, on, on the Titanic. If you can't sell the properties, it doesn't make any difference whether it's a limb in a company or your own, you know. In order to get good value from Facebook and YouTube ads, does the product you're selling have to be high value to make it worth it? I don't seem to make money from promoting my blog on Facebook. It probably helps that you are selling a high value product, but I mean, you can get very, very good traffic and very, very good return on your investment on Facebook or YouTube uh, for your advertising money. But at the end of the day, you do need a consumer then of either your product or service. And it is useful if you are selling services like I do, which have most of the time fairly high value. But regardless of that, um, YouTube advertising is incredibly cost effective and if I had a small business or if I was starting a small business and if I was starting out as an accountant or a management consultant or any sort of um, professional service for example then I would be looking at YouTube advertising and Facebook advertising and it's, um, it's no secret that that's where I spend my money at the moment and I wouldn't advertise on LinkedIn and I wouldn't advertise on Twitter How do you work out the amount of tax, VAT, etc. you need to add to the selling price of a product? Thanks, Terry. J1 Adventures. J1 Adventures, you don't work out the, the VAT. The government tells you how much VAT you have to charge. So for a professional service, it's 23%. For uh, construction, it's 13.5%. For meat and vegetables, it's 0%. And there's one other rate, but the bottom line is the rate is set. So, you know, if, for example, I'm doing a house conveyance or a lease on a property or something, and my professional fee is 1250 or 1500 quid, well, then the VAT rate is 23%. So it's 1250 plus VAT at 23% or 1500 quid plus VAT at 23%. But there's no way of working out in it. What's new with Prince? After how many owned property should I start to consider creating a limited company? Once again, thanks. Here's the limited company question again. I really don't know what this obsession with the limited company is. As I say, you can buy a limited company next week or the week after and set it up uh, with a quick express formation service and you get any number of them online. 
Um, so I'm not sure why the questions keep popping up in relation to setting up a limited company. But, um, you know, it's up to yourself as to how many properties you intend buying or when you might want to, or think it's a good idea to set up a limited company. The key is, is the property a good investment? And have you the ability to finance it? And are banks prepared to continue financing it? And is the market, you know, going to remain sufficiently strong and so on and so forth? Skilled T, starting a company is harder than you think, costs more than you think, takes longer than you think, longer hours, more stressful than you think, but more rewarding than you can ever imagine. Well, that's to do with starting your own business or running your own business, and that's fair enough. I mean, it's not for everybody. It is for me, and it has been for me since 1986, December 1986, which is a fair length of time, but it's not for everybody. And... Um, you do need to put in the time and you need to put in the work and people who have been hustling and grinding and who have been entrepreneurial and who have run their own business all their life, they know what it's like. Um, and the other people don't know what it's like. And they're probably, you know, are people who are cut out for it and there are people who are most certainly not cut out for it, in my view. What type of company should I set up to sell my own bicycles? This is the company question again. I don't know why you want to set up a company to sell your bicycles. By all means, you can set up a company to sell your bicycles if you want to. But there's nothing to stop you from selling your bicycles tomorrow or the next day if you want without setting up a limited company. If you've got a decent bicycle and it's at a good price and people are prepared to buy it. So again, I say again, repeat it. It's not a question of the structure. It's a question of getting clients, getting customers, getting punters. And if you have a good uh, product, a good bicycle, then don't worry about the structure. Don't worry about the company at the moment. Worry about getting clients. Worry about getting people to take out the credit card or cold hard cash and buy the bicycle off you. Michael O'Donnell, did you ever hold a casual trader's license? No, I did not hold a casual trader's license. Most of the trading that I did didn't involve casual trading. It was in retailing and it was in various, um, generally in retailing and uh, in construction and in property and in property investment and a bit of building and uh, things of that nature. I even had a licensed trade one or a licensed pub one time and um, didn't require a casual trader's license though. D. Fresher says, Toils and Troubles of Being Self-Employed is a book I found very helpful. That's good. That's good. Um, yeah, there's any amount of books you can get um, about starting and running your own business and so on, but you do need to have a bit of a bit of street smarts about you you need to have a bit of savvy and you need to be light on your feet be nimble and learn as you go and iterate and don't place too much too much uh, reliance on what you might read in books Pure unintentional ASMR. Hello, Terry. I'd like to set up a private limited company that helps people who want to set up private limited companies. Could you put me in touch with your commenters, please? There's a gentleman there, or lady perhaps, pure intentional ASMR. You'll see him or her in the comments. They are proposing to set up uh, limited companies for you. And maybe he is the person or she's the person who's going to get the greatest value out of this live stream today because he or she has recognized the obsession that people seem to have with setting up a limited company and is obviously running with that particular opportunity and going to um, provide a service where he sets up the limited companies or she sets up the limited companies. More luck to them. That's the whole nature of being entrepreneurial. That's the whole nature of being and running your own business and so on. So we're getting close to lunchtime there. I don't think there's any more. If you have any more questions, you can stick them in there. 
thanks for joining me on the on this live stream the next one i do will probably be on either employment law or on property so property or employment law will be my next live stream it'll either be next week or the week after and you might be interested in uh, coming along to that one and and um, popping your questions there in the live stream thanks for uh, joining me today anyway and i'm going to be going now shortly because i'm getting hungry and i hope you found it useful i hope you found it useful and um thanks for joining me there's one more okay thanks to employment law please yeah did you ever think of, of setting up an investment club no no i did not think of setting up an investment club i have enough of a difficulty or a hard time investing on my own behalf without dragging in other people to it so um no i haven't done so anyway adam graham says brilliant i'll follow your youtube page good stuff and diana thank you thank you for sharing your time and knowledge it was useful thanks diana and thanks for joining me hope you're keeping well and your family do, 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 j1 adventures thank you terry okay look thanks a lot thanks for joining me join me with an, on the next live stream the next live stream as i say will either be on property or employment law and after that then i'll have a review and see what i'm going to do but as i said thanks for joining me and um, take care of yourself and stay safe